In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I am going to wrap up my Big Board 1.0 with my top 10 prospects. Last week, I gave you a couple episodes. I broke it into three parts. This is the final part. Find out who are my top 10 prospects in my way too early Big Board 1.0. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. It is August 29th. I'm recording the 28th, but it's 29th. And August blew by. Like August is almost over. September is right around the corner which means we're getting closer to the start of basketball season. Basketball in Europe has already started. There's been a few teams that have already played friendly games, and it just shows you how different the basketball schedule is across the world. I know they've played some exhibition games in Australia. They've played some some teams in France that have already played, and NBA players aren't even, like, reported to camp yet. So, again, that just shows you how different the calendars are in the basketball world i will be in las vegas i guess it's the week after next for the ignite versus perth wildcats game or two games looking forward to that unfortunately they announced that ote will be playing against perth on saturday which is september 10th and i already booked my ticket so maybe if something changes, I can adjust my schedule. But I'm looking forward to that because I feel like I haven't watched a live basketball game, at least a live professional game since Summer League ended. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the Ignite's roster. I mean, they are loaded with with talent. I'm still trying to guess how they're going to keep everybody happy. You know, what's, what's the saying? A lot of cooks in the kitchen where they have a lot of prospects on that team, a lot of redundant skill sets. Just came out today that they've announced the veterans on the team. I'm just looking forward to seeing that. Then, of course, I want to see Alexander Saar, who I believe is one of the most talented players, gifted, most gifted and talented players in this class. But I actually have him at number 30 on my big board 1.0. He had a couple games this weekend where he showed some flashes, which possibly could have me bump him up a few spots but i'm not concerned about the talent it's just i want to see if the talent matches the production but anyway check out those two episodes again i did one where it was my prospects 30 through 21 then i had one that was the prospects 20 through 11. so this is my top 10. all right let's get it started coming in at number 10 is a player that, on one hand, and I, I'm, I'm just going with my gut feeling here, I think that he is a top 10 prospect. He does have a skill set that is considered very valuable in today's NBA. He could end up being like Derek Lively was last year. And with Lively, he ended up being the 12th pick. But on paper, when you look at the stats, It was not 12th pick or lottery pick production. Lively average about five points and five rebounds. But he got off to a slow start. He missed some time in the camp with a calf injury. Was, I mean, disappointing at the beginning of the year. And then as the season went on, when Duke caught their stride, he was a big, big reason for their late season success. And he became dominant on the defensive end. So I'm comparing Derek Lively to Aaron Bradshaw because Aaron Bradshaw is a seven-foot freshman from Kentucky. He actually was the teammate of Dewan Wagner in high school. He is expected to miss maybe some time. I know he's been out with a, with a fractured foot, and it was reported that he suffered the fractured foot at the McDonald's game. So that was back at the end of March. But I've heard that he is expected to be ready around October. But he's missed some significant time as far as just like working out during the summer. He missed the the global jams or the global jam in Toronto. So I I wouldn't be surprised if he gets off to somewhat of a slow start, similar to Lively. But 
I'm really high on Aaron Bradshaw. Again, seven footer, he's athletic, he is your, your rim protector, he's your shot blocker, but I'm really intrigued by the upside as a shooter. And there are some comparisons to Khalil Ware in a sense. You know, last year at this time, a lot of people were high on Khalil Ware. I mean, it was like Ware versus Lightly, who was going to be the, the first center off the board after Wimbayama. A lot of people thought were lottery picks. And even though I'm really high on Bradshaw, I, I wouldn't be totally stunned if he has a freshman season that is similar to Khalil Ware or Derek Lively. And there's, there's a big contrast between the two. Obvious, obviously, Lively went 12, Ware transferred, and is coming back for a second season. Now, what makes Bradshaw's situation interesting is that Kentucky now has four bigs that probably would be starters on most teams in college basketball, which is crazy because just a few weeks back, Kentucky barely even had enough players to fill the team. So with Bradshaw, he's in a situation where he could be the starter or he could be their fourth big. But I still have him at number 10 because I think he's going to show enough flashes as a shooter and as a run protector. What I'm really looking forward to seeing this year with Kentucky is will Calipari allow Aaron Bradshaw to shoot the three? I think if Bradshaw is able to show flashes as a shooter, I think it would definitely help his draft stock. But again, we're talking about Kentucky, John Calipari. There's a guy by the name of Carl Anthony Towns, who was arguably the best big man shooter in NBA history. Again, I'm saying arguably, but the numbers support that he is. If you look at his numbers, he is a better three-point shooter than Dirk Nowitzki on volume. But I said arguably because... But anyway, Carl Anthony Towns is a great three-point shooter, but he only attempted eight three-pointers as a freshman at Kentucky. He's a 39% three-point shooter from three in his NBA career, and I felt like Cat showed the flashes of being a three-point shooter before he got to Kentucky, but Calipari and Kentucky teams aren't really known for shooting threes. In the past 12 years, only one Kentucky team has finished in the top 250 nationally in three-point attempts per game. So with all that being said, I do think that there is a chance that Calipari may new school his offense and allow guys to shoot threes. At least that's what they, they were able to do in the global jam. And if Calipari opens the offense up, and Bradshaw is used as a pick-and-pop threat, and he is showing the, the promise as a defender and the touch around the rim, I think he could be a top 10 pick. All right, at number nine, I have his teammate, DJ Wagner. Now, Wagner is someone that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to this season. I think he's more so of a combo guard than a point guard but I believe as of right now he is the projected starter at point guard so if he can show the ability to really run a team and, and, and set guys up and, and, and figure out that balance then I think he could be a top 10 pick there are some people that believe he can go as high as five some people believe he can go in the top three and then there's people that believe that he's a late first round pick because there are some concerns he is 6'3 175 I mean, not terrible size. He is a, a little thin, needs to put on some weight, but he's not like a phenomenal athlete. But what he is, is a natural scorer. He is a guy that can get buckets. He just oozes with confidence. He's aggressive. And if you don't know, he is the son of Dewan Wagner, who is the son of Milt Wagner, which DJ Wagner could be the first third generation NBA player. Do you know how crazy that is? Third generation NBA player, which I mean, we're, we're months away from it happening. But again, he is a very gifted scorer, whether it's finishing around the rim, get into his pull up jumper, has the, the craftiness that I really like in the scores. He, he's a bucket. He's a guy that I don't have any issues if the ball is in his hands late in the shot clock, I feel confident that he is going to be able to get off a good shot. Now, the concern is 
He's a streaky shooter, but not the best three-point shooter. And again, I think he's more of a combo guard than a natural playmaker, even though he does show, again, flashes of court vision. But I feel like a lot of people, including myself, thought the same about Keontae George last year. Keontae was someone that his, his reputation coming into college was that he's a scorer. He thinks score first, second, maybe pass third. Then at Baylor, I, don't, I wouldn't say he was in the best position because it had two other small guards to showcase his lead guard skills. And between that and the injury and some inefficient shooting that was related to the injury, Keontae falls out of the lottery. But in summer league, he was the best rookie in my opinion and he showed the flashes of lead guard skills. So I think that DJ Wagner could end up with a Keontae George type. Well, he has the same reputation, at least coming into school. But I think he's going to have more on-ball reps than Keontae did last year at Baylor. But I also feel like in Summer League, he'll probably have more freedom to show everything that he can do. Because we all know that if you go to Kentucky, you are going to have to sacrifice. All right. The next player that I want to talk about coming in at number eight is Tyrese Proctor. Now, Proctor is someone that I'm really high on. He's actually my favorite returning player in college basketball. And I love his ability to get his own shot. I love the offensive creativity, the shot creation. And he is a player that I think is due for a breakout year. Now, last year, he averaged nine points, three assists, and three rebounds per game in 29 minutes for Duke. Got off to an absolutely brutal start. Brutal start. In his first 12 games, he only shot 35% from the floor. Picked it up in the second half of the season, and then I thought that him along with Lively and, and I mean, just overall Duke's team, but I thought his growth as a player played a big role in Duke's late season success. And he is someone that... I believe is again due for a breakout season. I think the passing is there. Now, I felt like last year, coming into his freshman season, I thought the passing would be his greatest strength and his best ability, his best NBA trait. And then when he was playing off the ball, I didn't really see it. I think this year he's going to have a lot more freedom with the ball in his hands, even though Duke has in my opinion, too many guards. They have like four really good guards. But I think this year the ball is going to be in his hands a little bit more. We're going to see a little bit more of the passing. Now, if he can show the ambidextrous passing that he showed at the NBA Academy along with the shot making and improve as a shooter, then I think he is due for a big year. But the biggest concern for me is I want to see him improve his efficiency, which I think will be fine with a year of experience. And he's got to get stronger. He has to get stronger and be able to play through contact. Last year, he only shot 53% at the rim. 53% at the rim. So he has to bump that number up if he's looking to improve his draft stock and have a big sophomore year. All right, when we return, I'll finish out my top 10. But I want to talk to you about FanDuel because the NFL season is right around the corner. And FanDuel has incredible offers because right now, if you are a new customer, you can bet $5, $5, you can get 200 in bonus bets, guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off the NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. So now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy, it's very simple to use, and you can bet on everything from the spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer that you do not want to miss. Again, FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the NFL and locked on. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And in the next episode, Richard Stamen will be on. Of course, we're going to talk about the 2024 NBA Draft. Maybe even touch on some of the international, some of the FIBA play from this summer. All right, coming in at number seven, I have Donovan Klingen. Donovan Klingen is 
a guy that I believe is going to be in the running for National Player of the Year. 7'2", 265, coming off a national championship run as a freshman for UConn. The middle was all his with Adama Sanogo gone. And as a freshman, Klingon was probably the most impactful freshman in limited minutes. 6.9 points, 5.6 rebounds, 1.8 blocks per game in 13 minutes of action. So with that being said, and this is what's very interesting to me about the NBA draft. Lively had less productive numbers in more minutes, and he goes 12. I don't think if Klingon would have entered the 2023 draft, he would have went lottery. I, I think he, I would have went taking him in the first round. But that just shows you how the pre-draft or, or pre-college high school hype can carry a player throughout the season because Klingon wasn't, you know, your McDonald's all American. He wasn't someone that everybody was talking about as a one and done. He literally kind of came out of nowhere outside of people in the Northeast that knew about him, but his numbers were better than lively, but lively goes 12. So I think this year with the buzz that he has around his name, I think he's going to go top 10 easily. And that's why I'm so high on him. But again, 6.9 points, 5.6 rebounds, 1.8 blocks in 13 minutes. That's crazy. Now, I'm not a 100 processions guy. I don't really like to use those stats. But in this case, I will to support my argument of how dominant Klingon was in the minutes that he played. Now, if you take it down to 100 possessions, he averaged 30 points, 25 rebounds, and 8 blocks per game. I mean, those are like Wilt Chamberlain, Bill, Wilt Chamberlain numbers in a sense. But... He's capable of those numbers in a sense because he did it in high school. He averaged 30 points, 18 rebounds, and six blocks per game as a senior in high school. I don't know why he wasn't as highly touted as some of the other guys in his class because at this time last year, the talk was on where and why, uh, where and lively. I don't. I didn't hear people talk about Donovan Klingon until about January. Now I expect Klingon to have a big year. Can he keep up with that production at that pace? Very doubtful, but if he averages 18 and 11 and four blocks, I mean, I think those numbers alone should put him in maybe even even in the top five. But he's not your typical modern day big. He is not a center that spaces the floor. He's not like your your nifty passer like Jokic, even though he's shown some flashes of being able to read defenses. And he's just a, a dominant interior presence who just impacts the game on the defensive end. Now, at his size, with a 7'7 wingspan, he's going to be a huge threat in the middle. But what I would like to see out of him this year is, one, to improve as a shooter from the foul line. It would be a bonus if he's knocking down like shots at the short corners and the elbows and showing some extended range. That would be a bonus. But I don't think he needs to really show that to solidify his draft position because with his size, he could be basically bailing the defense out if he's settling for shots outside of the paint trying to show his range. But if he can knock him down, that's great. But with his size and his strength and mobility and athleticism, I mean, I just want to see him dominate the paint. But I would definitely like to see him improve as a foul shooter because 51% from the foul line is obviously it's not good, but I think on the NBA level, it can impact how much he plays late in games because, you know, you don't want a guy that you can't give the ball to or he's running from the ball because he doesn't want to get fouled. But then with his defensive impact, he is, I imagine, going to be a huge part of a team's defensive strategy and game plan. All right. At number six, a player that has moved up my board just from watching a little bit of a film and, and, and re-watching film, but Stefan Castle, and I've mentioned before, he reminds me of Markel Fultz. Now, if he can have a Markel Fultz type year, especially with this draft that is wide open, he could end up top five, top three, because Castle has the size at 6'6", six, 6'6", six, six, six point guard, freshman at UConn. He has the size and just this, this pace and smoothness to his game that I, I really like. I think he's going to be a primary ball handler in, in the NBA. Him and Klingon, I mean, I believe they will form like 
the best one-two punch in college basketball. Too bad that, you know, there's not like great spacing in college basketball because I would love to see them in like a situation where they're surrounded by shooters and making defenders just pick their poison on how to defend their pick and roll because I think they would be really dynamite as, as a pick and roll combination. But what I would like to see from Castle is growth as a shooter. I think he's a solid shooter, but he would definitely need to improve as a shooter, show more consistency if he's going to rise up in the top five. But I love the fact that he can shoot off the dribble and he uses his size to his advantage. You put a smaller guard on him, he's going to pull up and shoot over the top of him like he's not there. He finishes with both hands around the rim and... He is a, a player that I believe if he can put it all together, he has the tools in the game to be a three-level scorer. If you're a three-level scorer at 6'6 and can make plays for others, you're going to get paid. <laughs> you're going to get paid a lot of money. I wonder how they use him because with his size, and sometimes in college basketball, you see it definitely a lot in high school basketball. If a guy has size and he's a good playmaker, but there are guys on the team that are smaller, that are 6'1", 6'2", and they deserve to be in a starting lineup. Sometimes you can see that big guard get pushed to a wing position to make room for the five best players on the floor, which doesn't necessarily put that big ball handler in his best position to succeed. So I wonder how many minutes is Castle going to play off the ball this season. I think if he has to play a lot off the ball, I think it may hurt him a little bit because the outside shooting is something that needs to be addressed. All right, when we return, I'll finish out my top players, the last remaining players on my big board 1.0. All right, last segment, and I want to start off with USC point guard Isaiah Collier. Collier is a player that some people think has a chance to, to be number one. 6'4", 205 pounds. He is strong. He is physically imposing. And he is a player that loves to play in the open court. He thrives and excels in the open court and with freedom. He's a threat to get downhill. And once he's downhill, I mean, with his size and strength, he's punishing defenders. How often do you hear about that? A guy that has the ball in his hands and he's punishing defenders with his physicality. And when defenses collapse on him, he is arguably the best passer, playmaker in this class. Just has an excellent feel for the game, controls the pace, whips live dribble passes. And he is a walking paint touch. He's a walking paint touch that gets to the foul line a lot. And he is someone that makes players better. Makes players better. Now, the big concern with Isaiah Collier is the outside shooting. I think that he has a long ways to go as an outside shooter. And I've mentioned in a previous podcast, I think he's just been so good with the ball in his hands throughout his career that he's hasn't really had to play off the ball and hasn't really had to like really focus on his jumper because he's been able to get to his spots on the floor at will with his size and speed and strength. So this is an area for him. I, I, I mean, I believe that he spent a lot of time this summer working on his jumper. I mentioned that I saw him in Las Vegas during summer league. He was at Impact, and he was up early in the morning working on his shot off the catch. So that's going to be the swing skill that could – really propel him into the top five or maybe if he really struggles as a shooter it could push him to the back end of the lottery but the talent is there like I said with the size the, and the playmaking and his ability to just make players better and get to the foul line I think he, he's a safe bet to be in the lottery but it's the shooting that is the swing skill especially off the catch I think he's shows some glimpses of being able to get to his spots and pull up off the dribble but it's it's more so of a rhythm shot but off the catch is where he really really struggles all right number four and this is I mean, I, if you listen to the past episodes I, i've had some some takes that are considered against the grain but number four is one that is totally against the grain and i'm extremely high on l marco jackson now, I'll, I'll say it like this. 
He is in a situation at Kansas where he's probably not going to have the keys like Isaiah Collier. He is in a, a battle with four other guards that are going to play. Dewan Harris is going to play. He was on the national championship team. Kevin McCullough is coming back. He's going to play, but I think with his size, you can kind of move him to, to, the, to the three. Then you have Arterio Morris, who's a McDonald's All-American, who was really their best player when Kansas went on an international trip this summer. So El Marco doesn't have like a clear cut path to having the ball in his hands and being able to basically rock out. But I'm still higher on him than the masses. I think he's one of the top five most talented players in this class. I'm intrigued by his burst, his speed. I haven't seen many defenders that can stay in front of him. And then once he gets to the rim, he is an athletic finisher that can finish and make plays above the rim. I love the fact that he is a defender. He loves to defend. His defense is, I don't want to say it's ahead of his offense, but just the mindset to go out and be aggressive and defend, I think is really going to help him, even if he has limited minutes. Again, even if he plays limited minutes because Kansas is so deep at guard, I think the way that he'll pressure guys, pick up full court with his strength, and then I think with the flashes of playmaking and athleticism and scoring, I think that he is going to be fine. Again, I have him at number four. Don't know if he goes number four because he may not have the opportunities, but I love the fact that he's strong, he's physical, he plays through contact, finishes above the rim. He has the athleticism, the burst, and the speed that I like. I think he has the upside as a three-level scorer also just because, again, finishes at the rim, he can get to his pull-up, and he, he has, like I said, the tools to be one of the better defenders in the country. The big question mark is where is he going to play? Is he going to play more so off the ball, which I think is more so the case, which is probably going to limit his ability to really showcase his playmaking. I think that is like the biggest, if there's a swing skill for him, is showcasing the playmaking. Can he run a team? Can he find guys and make all the right reads? But again, I'm very, very high on El Marco Jackson. I have him at number four. All right, coming in at number three, and number one, two, and three can flip-flop for me. I mean, Monday, Ron Holland could be number one. Tuesday, it could be Matas Bazoulis. Wednesday, it could be Justin Edwards. Today is Monday, so I have Ron Holland at number three. Holland really has a chance to be number one. He is just one of the best high school players that I've seen from a standpoint of just impacting games on both ends of the floor, just off pure energy, athleticism, hustle, and determination. Ron is a winner. He's won on every level. And the key for Ron is, is showing like the perimeter skill set. Like if he can show that he's knocking down shots and creating off the dribble, then the sky's the limit for Ron. At 6'8", 200 pounds, and also he'll be playing for the Ignite this year. At 6'8", 200 pounds, Ron is, I want to call him a tweener in a sense because he dominated the high school level playing at like the four. And he was an excellent rebounder in the high school level. But he showed, you know, that he is capable of playing the wing. But in high school at 6'8", he was bigger than a lot of the players on the floor. And he dominated just down low around the basket. But he did show flashes as a guy that could put the ball on the floor. But one thing about Ron, when he puts the ball on the floor, it's not like he's super shifty and he's, he's like beating guys with multiple moves. It's like no nonsense. He, he's a couple dribbles and he's downhill. Very efficient with his, with his movement. Doesn't really waste a lot of possessions or dribbles. Just gets to his spots, gets downhill. I got some reports that when the Ignite were playing in the Rico Hines runs that he looked phenomenal, that he was knocking down shots, he was blocking shots, he was just hustling all over the place. So Ron Holland is someone that right, right now he's definitely in the early, early runnings to be the, the top pick in the 2024 NBA draft. He is someone that, like I said, does his damage around the rim. He's an aggressive downhill slasher. He makes plays above the rim, has a nice soft touch finish package around the basket. 
is a lot better passer than he gets credit for. He's a he's a very good ball mover. He's unselfish. Has a high IQ. I've heard someone say that they think he can develop into a point forward. That is something that I, I it that wasn't like the first thought that came to my mind when I saw him as a passer, but I saw him as just the connective tissue that makes the right reads. And like an example of Ron making the right reads, and this may sound very, very simple, but usually when you have guys of his skill set and his athleticism, usually in transition, if, if they're in transition, they are looking to make the highlight reel dunk. They want to wow the crowd. And Ron will do that. But if it's a two-on-one situation or if it's just in transition, he's going to make the right read. And there are times where he could possibly have a layup and it may be a little bit more degree of difficulty on his layup but he'll make the right read and pass it to a teammate he just has this iq of he knows if he's in transition he's going to draw the defender like the three on two two on one drill that we are there in high school but he knows how to draw the defender and make the right read i've seen him make like touch passes where you know someone kicks it to him and within one motion he'll catch it and throw a touch pass to a cutting teammate. So I think the passing is is very, very underrated. Defensively, he's a, a disruptor, can defend all over the floor, has has the tools and the, and the motor and athleticism to be a very, very high-level defender. Now, what I would like to see from him in 2023-24 is, again, showing the improvement as far as like offensive creativity off the dribble if he's able to show more wing and perimeter skills which again he's shown flashes of perimeter skills but if he can show more perimeter skills and playmaking then i think he has a real shot at being number one all right number two it is his teammate from the g league ignite matas Bazoulas. now Again, my top three are, are interchangeable. Bazoulas is 6'11", 195. He could very well be the first pick in next June's draft. Due to his combination of size, skill, and passing, he's 6'10". He handles the ball like a guard. Is a natural wing. At 6'10", there's nothing interior about his game. He is a natural wing. He's a good shooter from deep. Shot over 43% from three last season in high school. I think that at the minimum is a skill set. Is a 6'11 wing that can handle, that can knock down open shots, whether it's shooting off the catch, on the move. He has a little bit of pull up in his game. And when you're 6'11 and you can create offense for yourself, you're going to be crazy enticing for, for NBA scouts. And he does have like creativity, whether it's step backs, floaters, pull up jumpers, touch around the rim. He's got a lot in his skill set. He's got a, a big bag of tricks on the offensive end. I think there is plenty of upside for him to be a wing playmaker because of his passing. But he's a guy that has good vision as a passer. But I would say, this may sound weird to some, his decision making is behind his passing if that makes sense so he can get assists he can create shots for others with his passing but sometimes that he doesn't make good decisions with the ball which is why his turnovers like outnumbered his assists in high school now what i would like to see from him is bulking up getting stronger 6'11 195 he's, he's a little thin what position does he play i think him and ron in my opinion even though today's nba is all about versatility in my opinion i think ron is more so of a natural four that is going to have to show wing skills and i think matas is a three that at his size if he gets stronger could be a real weapon at the four in the nba so i wonder like when they play together how is that going to look on one hand you can say it's versatility but I'm just curious to see how, how they work out together. But what I would like to see out of Azulis is getting stronger. He's definitely going to have to get stronger and bulk up. While he was a good shot blocker on the high school level, I'm interested to see if that translates on the pro level. Because in high school, he was he could kind of roam and he was like this weak side shot blocker. And if that translates on the pro level where he is a, a, a player that's getting a block a game or he's altering shots, then I think that definitely will, will help his case to be the number one pick. But again, I would just like to see how he's used this year and how he handles the physicality.
All right, at number one, I have Justin Edwards from Kentucky. So that is three Kentucky players in my top 10 and really four in my top 12. If you're wondering, am I like a Kentucky fan? Am I being biased towards Kentucky? No, that is just how the cookie crumbled when I did my Big Board 1.0, just by going by my gut feeling. And with Justin Edwards, the key to Justin Edwards' game or what makes him my number one player is the versatility. Justin Edwards does so many things well on the basketball court. It's actually hard to figure out what he does best. Like what is his greatest skill set? What is the skill set that he can hang his hat on? And I don't know because like I said, he does so many things well. He can impact games really on both ends of the floor with his size, his athleticism, his motor, his natural scoring instincts. He rebounds, he finishes at the rim, he can knock down pull-up jumpers, he can shoot outside jumpers. He is I'd say that he's like a really safe bet. Like he's he's very, very safe. It, does he have the same upside as a Bazoulas? I think that is debatable because I think if Bazoulas puts it together because of his size and, and so on, I think some may say that Bazoulas has a higher upside. And maybe you could say the same about Ron. But I think as far as just being a safe bet, and I'm not always the type to play a safe, I'm a risk taker. But for some reason, my gut feeling is telling me Justin Edwards will be the top player in this draft class, especially if he shoots it well. Now, if he shoots the if he shoots the ball well, which again I talked about at the beginning of the episode, Kentucky is not known for letting guys have freedom to let it fly from deep. But if he's able to shoot the ball at let's say 37, 38 percent from three on a good volume of attempts, and he's also rebounding and, and and showing like some flashes as a playmaker and finishing at the rim, then I think he can be the number one pick. But he's going to have to sacrifice. I do not think that his numbers statistically are going to be as good as a Bazoulas or Ron Holland because one, in the G League, they're going to score more points. Everything is totally catered around them. And then if you go to Kentucky, you're going to have to sacrifice. So this is going to be an interesting draft for me because it's so wide open. Every player that is in the top five has something that I think is that can really, really prevent them from being the number one pick. So whether it's it's Edwards sacrificing a play with all the talent on Kentucky, the same can be said for Bazoulas and Holland because Ignite are deep. Then you look at, you know, Isaiah Collier. The shooting is is a real concern. You look at El Marco. It's is he going to have the freedom to, to really get loose? Donovan Klingon, I mean, is a team going to take a non-tradition or, or is a team going to take a traditional old school center number one? That's why this draft class has really, really grown on me in the last few weeks. I'll be honest, back in April or May, I was dreading this 24 class because it lacked the star power. I was wondering, like, are, are people really going to even be interested in this class because... You know, there, there's not a Wim Benyama. There's not like a Scoot Henderson. There's not a player that casual fans are going to be really, really excited about. But the fact that this draft is so wide open that we have no idea who's going to go number one. It is going to be, at least right now, one of my favorite drafts in recent memory because it's it's so wide open. Like I actually spoke to an NBA front office executive and he mentioned Donovan Klingon could go number one, which, I mean, that just shows you how wide open this draft is. But anyway, that wraps up this episode. Thank you for listening to part three of a three-part series. This is my Big Board 1.0. I will be releasing a Big Board, hopefully, once every month when the season starts. And we're just going to do these Big Boards all the way up until the 2024 NBA draft. Once again, that wraps up this episode. It's Rafael Barlow, and I am... Out.